Again, welcome here to our symposium. We're happy to have you and uh, hope the, the day has gone well for you and will tomorrow. So I'm Mike Wood, Deputy Commissioner of the Austin Public Safety at DCGS. For those that don't know me, I get the privilege tonight to introduce our keynote speaker, Chief A.C. Roper from Birmingham, Alabama. So he insisted that I not read his very long bio in the folder, so I'll leave that to you to read yourself, but I just wanted to let you know that that is actually the abridged version of his bio. <laughs> And I have that on my phone, and I read through it, and you know, I, I just got to say it's, it's quite amazing, frankly. I will not read it all, but I just want to talk about a couple, couple key highlights. <clears throat> Excuse me. So Chief Roper, as you could tell, was born in Birmingham and spent his police career of over 30 years in three different police departments around his home state in Alabama, returning as police chief in late 2007, where he serves today. You can also tell in a, in a vast generalization here that he's highly educated and experienced. A couple of master's degrees, so on and so forth. Also has a 32-year military career, which I think is also mentioned in there, uh, as a major general in the U.S. Army Reserves. But what you won't see in the abridged version, <coughs> excuse me, is that he's a recipient of the Bronze Star, was also a recipient of the General Douglas MacArthur Leadership Award which is given to top leaders in the United States Army. So with that, Chief, I promise to be brief. I thank you for your years of service, not only in your home state, but also to our country. And thank you for being with us today. Chief A.C. Roper. Let me start by saying good evening, everyone. Good evening. And it is an honor to be with you here tonight. And I do recognize that I'm the last thing between you and the bar. And so, uh, so let me check my clock right here, okay? <laughs> if you could give me about 20 minutes, I would get out the way and the stampede can begin. All right. Uh, but it is an honor to be here. And I must admit I'm a little jealous uh, because we don't have anything like this in the state of Alabama. And so don't take this for granted that this is going on all over the nation because it's not. And so for Give and everyone who's a part of that and the funding piece because fighting crime, reducing crime, improving our communities, it costs us. It's not free. And so this is a great, great organization that you have here. So I also have to admit that my heart's a little heavy as I look across the spectrum and see the challenges that we're facing in our criminal justice system and the challenges we're facing in modern day law enforcement. But I am optimistic because over 30 years ago, a young fellow woke up in one of the most crime written public housing communities in the city of Birmingham. And on that morning that he woke up, he started the police academy. And now 30 years later, he's the chief of that city. So this country is an amazing country and it is the land of opportunity because my grandmother raised five of us on what was called the wrong side of the tracks and we were recipients of public assistance and all of that, but she believed in working hard and she believed in showing respect and she believed in discipline and accountability and all the things that we try to live out today. Uh, but I still wonder though, if that kid woke up today, could he make it? If he woke up this morning in a public housing community in one of our cities, could he make it? And so I ask that question because times have changed. And as we look across this nation, we see, you see, we've all lived this discourse on race and policing, the riots, the mistrust, the challenges with community policing, and all of the things that we're facing today and all of the the solutions that we're discussing here at this symposium. But as I've thought about it, uh, I tell the staff quite often, I get to travel uh, all over the nation, not just from a police perspective, but from a major general perspective in Army Reserve, I have units in 41 states. So uh, the general has to get out and shake hands and do all those things and do inspections and all the stuff that they require us to do. And I'm kind of connected technology-wise. I have three iPhones and two iPads. I kid you not, I really do. 
two here and one there right now. And uh, so the only time I get to, un to just unhook is when I'm on an airplane. I get to turn everything off and think. And I go back to the office and I'll tell the staff I've been thinking. They go, oh no, <laughs> no, not again, not again. Because they know I have some deep thoughts and I've been jotting things down. And they're like, oh no, please stop thinking. And so, uh, <laughs> Just stop thinking, please. I mean, you really set the organization back when you think. I mean, so, uh, so, uh, and and so here are some thoughts that I've had about the, the, these current challenges we're facing, and I think we're seeing the congruence of, of three factors. Uh, the first is, as we all recognize, the police are the most visible arm of city government. We're the most visible, and as they often say, politics is local. Well, the police department is normally the largest organization in city government. And we're the most visible. I love my fire department brothers and sisters. And as I told my fire chief a little while back, you guys don't patrol. Those big red trucks just sit in the bay until someone calls you. Then you go out, answer the call, then you come back. Then you cook a nice meal. <laughs> and then you eat until you get tired. And then you sleep until you get hungry. And in between, someone may call you. And, and so, He's like, you, you stop saying that. I said, but it's true. And so, and so across our nation, we have somewhere between 800,000 and 900,000 law enforcement officers that are working every day. And the vast majority do an amazing job. And they're an extremely visible presence. And that presence represents the face of the criminal justice system. Our local police departments and sheriff's agencies and all of those we're the gatekeepers, and so quite often police departments are the face of a criminal justice system that some people see as being unfair. From the laws to the incarceration policies, the police and local law enforcement, we don't make those laws, but because we're the face, we get blamed for three strikes and you're out and all those kinds of things. And these policies quite often negatively impact our communities of color where we need the strongest relationships. The second factor I, I see out there is, and you will agree with this, the socioeconomic conditions and challenges of the day will often rest in the lap of a police officer. So that means at 2 o'clock in the morning, we have a 21-year-old officer standing on the corner trying to address social conditions that he or she aren't equipped to address. So when the poverty rate is too high, when the unemployment rate is too high, when the high school dropout rate is too high, it often falls in the lap of a police officer. This issue of homelessness, I was returning some emails tonight, a local business owner complaining about homeless people outside the, the, the restaurant. We're trying to help them solve it. If you arrest them, they're, they're still homeless when they get out. So that's not the answer. We need a better answer than that. Uh, this response to mental illness is a challenge across our nation. You know, there's no, at least in Alabama, there are no 24-hour mental illness agency responses out there. Nobody call, comes but the police department. So when the uncle stops taking his psychiatric medicine, we call the police. If he takes too much and get out of control, we call the police. Uh, if the 14-year-old is doing what was cute when he was three, because it's not cute now. Those words he was saying when he was three, they were cute. But now at 14, they're not so cute. We call the police. Uh, when he or she doesn't go to school, we call the police. If they don't get home on time, we call the police. And so we have an over-reliance on law enforcement in this day and time. Funding has been cut significantly for so many of our social service agencies. And when institutions fail, government, family, schools, we call 911. Uh, our 911 center in Birmingham receives somewhere between 14,000 and 15,000 telephone calls a week. Now some of those are duplicates because everyone has a cell phone. But 14 to 15,000 calls per week and we have to answer every call. And, and what I'm finding is, and it's almost humorous, but some of the things that people are calling us for because of this over-reliance. And so I like to go, go to roll calls and talk to our officers. And one officer was explaining to me about the call he received the, the week before about the, a bird was in the house. And so the lady called the police. She called 911, and we sent an officer. 
and he's running around the house trying to get the bird out. And the bird is refusing to leave. And uh, he was finally able to convince the bird to fly out the house, and then she wanted a police report. And he did not want to take a police report, but he knew a complaint would ensue, so he went on and took the complaint and, and filed a report. And uh, I don't know what criminal code the bird broke, maybe burglary. I mean, I'm not, I'm not sure, but we have a report on file now because of the bird in the house. Uh, there was one I heard on the radio, and I just didn't know how to address it at the time, so I was going to let the staff and the officers figure it out. Uh, it later called because there was a turtle crossing the road. And she was concerned he wouldn't make it. So she called 911. We answered the phone. We sent an officer. He gets there and he can't find the turtle. So he leaves. He gets 10 8 back in service. He leaves and she's mad because he didn't find the turtle. So she called back. So then we sent two officers. They parked their shiny new patrol cars and they got out the car. They started trying to find the turtle. And I'm, I'm listening. I'm thinking, if he's not smashed in the road, he made it. <laughs> he made it. I was a detective for three years and I can figure that out. He made it. He made it. He made it. We don't need to put up crime scene tape. If he's not smashed in the road, he's not turtle soup, he made it across the road. So we looked and looked and looked and we could not find the turtle. So I'm, I'm here to report that he made it across the street and he's living a long, productive life now. And, and then we received, a, we received a good call. Sometimes there are good calls. Uh, I, I, I come in the office one day and my executive assistant says, Chief, uh, uh, you need to return this call because this elderly gentleman wants to speak to you. And normally if someone calls with a problem, the staff will try to get it resolved so it doesn't sit on my desk and I have to return the calls. We want to solve it at the lowest level. But he insisted on talking to the chief. So I called him and he said, Chief, I just want to thank you. And I said, yes, sir. Uh, for what? He said, uh, you sent, uh, no, you sent, because I'm the chief, so I sent him. He said, I, I, I'm, I'm an elderly gentleman, and, and I'm an invalid, and I can't get out much. And my neighbor went to the grocery store for me, but when he got back with my groceries, he had an emergency, so he had to run off, and, and he left the groceries in the car. And I couldn't get out there to get the groceries. So what did he do? Call 911. He said, so I called 911, Chief, and you sent a nice young man over here, and he got the groceries out the car, and not only did he get the groceries out the car, but he actually put the groceries up for me. And I began to picture this young crime fighter in the kitchen with his bulletproof vest and all the gear on, and, and he's saying, sir, where would you like the sugar? And where can I put the bread? And he put it all up, and the gentleman said, uh, and then when he left, he told me, if we ever need him again, I just need to call him. And I thought, what a great story. <laughs> what a great story. And we have officers all over the nation providing that kind of service. And then you may think he really went too far, but in this day and time, I wish I had more that would put the groceries up, because we need the good media publicity right now. And, and so we have people doing that all the time. But when we ask the deeper question, should police officers be in the kitchen putting up groceries? You know, that's, 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 he did it because it was needed, but that's another socioeconomic condition that has fallen in the lap of the, of the, of the police officer. And he did it the best way he could, and he helped this almost a young man, but he was an older gentleman, and uh, represented the police department extremely well. And if we get that call again today, we will respond. And hopefully the officer will do the same thing. But as you can see, and it's not just in Birmingham, but across the nation, we have this over-reliance on police departments now. And then the third issue that I, I think we're, we're facing that I think you all would agree with is social media has flattened the world. Uh, Thomas Friedman did a book many years ago called The World is Flat, where he talked about globalization and this pending te technology, technological revolution and all. We're, we're living in those days now. And, and now there's a race to be first because traditional media has to catch up because every person with a cell phone is a reporter. We're now having cases where loved ones are finding out that someone was killed, was a murder victim via social media 
before we can make the death knock, the death call, before we can knock on the door, they've already found out because someone has taken a picture of the deceit and laying there and posted it. And so now this drive to be first in our blog and Facebook and Twitter and Snapchat and everything else that's going on out there, it's really flattened the world. So what we have is police departments, police officers being the most visible part of city government, trying to resolve social issues that we're, we're not equipped to resolve, and it plays, off, plays out across the nation on social media. And so with these three challenges, I think we have three responses that people like you are living this every day. And the first one is we must value our communities and we must value people because community relationships are extremely, extremely vital. At times, we've gotten too data-driven, and reducing crime and improving communities is much more than putting a cop on the dot. We've got to humanize that experience much more. And so community policing must be more than a buzzword. Uh, it has to be the way we do business. We don't build trust by accident. I mean, it has to be purposeful. And people have to feel that they have a voice and they can touch their police department because it is their police department. It is their criminal justice system. I, I meet regularly with our local Black Lives Matter group and, and I have such an amazing city that I have two groups now. <laughs> the first, the, the main group, they couldn't agree on their platform so they split into two groups. I hope they don't multiply again. So I, I, got, I got two groups right now. And so, and so as we work through that, but, but we meet periodically. We're, we're due for another meeting here soon. And, and as we share with them, we won't agree on everything, but there are some things we can agree on. So let's work together on what we can agree on and help improve our communities. Because even, even their leadership told me, they said, Chief, the, the reason we're having all these issues with crime is we need to strengthen our communities. If we can build our communities up, we won't have to call the police so much. And I said, listen, you must be in my iPad, because that's what I talk about all over the place. And so hopefully we can partner, we can partner on that. And so this community relation piece, as, as, as Tracy mentioned earlier, Birmingham is one of the six national sites uh, for the Building Trust uh, Initiative, so we're excited about that. Uh, we think it's really going to help change the way we do business over the next three years and set the foundation uh, moving forward. Then the second response I think we have, we have to have in addition to building uh, community relations and building trust is we have to embrace change. And I've been in policing now, as, as was mentioned earlier, a little over 30 years, and some of you have been doing it more. But one thing I found out about police officers, we hate the way things are, and we hate change. <laughs> I hate it here. I mean, the administration's out to get me. It's, 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 OK, we're going to change that. No, we're going to change. So, OK, so, OK. I, I, you tell us what we should do then. I mean, and so we hate the way things are and we hate change. And so, but the world is changing all around us. The community expectations are changing. And since we're community servants, we have to respond appropriately. And now I look around and, and, and this heroin issue that some of you are facing, we're facing it in Birmingham. I never thought I would see the day that our heroin overdoses would outnumber our homicide victims. And that's where we are now. Heroin overdoses have far exceeded, exceeded our, our homicide victims. And things that are well, commonplace in the good old days aren't so commonplace now because we've got to change. The days of mass incarceration, the days of st street sweeps, and, and we, did, we did street sweeps with the best of them. Well, we found out that mass incarceration doesn't work, and it's extremely expensive. And now... Efficiency is going to force us to change and do things uh, in a much more effective uh, manner. And then our third response is we must lead our way through these modern day policing challenges. So whether you work from a, from a district attorney's perspective or you're a community leader or you're a political leader, whatever the case is, we've got to lead our way through it. There's never a good substitute for leadership. So leadership must be out front. We must be communicating what we're doing and why we're doing. And then when we fall short, because we will, we have to hold ourselves accountable 
because when we don't, someone else will. And so I was thinking a few weeks ago on, on the plane, we're trying to develop leaders who can look around the corner and see what's coming. So we can be more proactive versus reactive. And it's not easy. It's extremely hard. Uh, I often share with our leadership, especially our sergeants, that that rank is the most important rank in the police department. And I often make them laugh when I say, you know, the chief could go home and take a nap. Nobody cares. But if you go home and take a nap, we're in trouble because you're the standard bearer. And you have to make sure our people are doing what they need to be doing. Because some of our challenges are self-inflicted. Some are self-inflicted. As we look back across the years, we thought we were doing the right things at the right times. But now we can look back and see, you know, we've done some things to some of our communities that we've got to help them dig out of that because we helped create some of those holes with some of our policies, some of our methods, some of our strategies. And it's good to have that self-awareness so that we can improve in the future. So regardless of the issues and the agenda, there's still nobility in what we do in our criminal justice system. Our citizens, our communities are counting on us. But to be successful, there must be a sense of fairness there must be a sense of legitimacy. There must be a sense of trust. And America is still the land of opportunity. But depending on where you stand, the opportunities look different. Or the lack of opportunities look different to different people, depending where they stand. So thank you so much for your attention. That was about 21 minutes. And so uh, I think I've met standard. And uh, uh, thank you so much for your attention tonight. All right, now just one more round of applause for Chief Roper. Thank you. So thank you all again for your participation and your involvement.